Hello and welcome back to the Trading Floor episode of the Market Maker podcast, where I'm joined by our co-founder, Piers Curran, and we've got three topics for discussion this week. Going to talk about the housing market. If you're based in the UK, you've probably been littered with headlines such as UK housing prices fall at their fastest rates since 2009. Lots of uh, concern here on the street in the UK. But this is more than just the UK. This is a, a global uh, topic. So we're going to discuss a little bit about the divergence in prices actually between the UK and the US. And also, could Denmark have the solution for Britain's broken housing market? Definitely interested to see why they have a potential uh, solution for us here uh, in the UK. So Piers, I know you're going to shed some light on that. And then UBS, they posted their biggest ever quarterly profit. So we'll dive into those numbers. They're one of the last European banks to report this season. And then thirdly, is the US labor market starting to show some cracks after the US job openings this week dropped to the lowest level in nearly two and a half years in the month of July? So to kick things off, why don't we talk a little bit then, Piers, about the housing market? Where do you want to go first, the UK or the US? Uh, well, let's go, let's go domestic. Let's go UK, shall we? Um, there's nothing like uh, the the media love a, a kind of doom and gloom um, housing market headline. So yeah, as you said, they've definitely served bad up this month. With obviously each month you get house price index data being released, and when these numbers drop, which give you the kind of latest monthly update, then the financial press tend to be all over that and. Um, they love a headline. So yeah, the headline, 5.3%. Um, that's the annualized uh, drop in house prices in the month of August. So house prices on average across the whole of the UK. Um, what's the price on average August 2023 compared to August 2022? And it's down 5.3%. Um, and in July, I mean, look, house prices have been declining Um well, actually, pretty much all year. It's just it's, if you like, the pace is increasing because in July, um, the annualized house price um, drop. Actually, I did have that data. Now I've lost it. Oh, hang on. I've got a different stat first. You can maybe give us the uh, the figure from last month. My different stat was, and the reason why it's kind of sensationalized is that um, the yeah, this is the sharpest fall, um, annualized fall since July 2009. So the speed of declines picking up, basically. Here, I've got it now. July, the decline was 3.8% year on year. Now it's 5.3% year on year. What's it going to be next month? Probably even a greater drop, right? As we come off the top, you really need to see, um, I guess, a, a house price chart to get it into context. So whilst we are declining, we're declining off those 2022 highs, all time highs. So we've been pegged back to now prices that we last saw at the start of 2022, mm. right? But look, the trend is in place. Prices are dropping and it's not a surprise. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the main things that I heard a comment from Nationwide, who's this data you're referring to, their chief economist, chap called Robert Gardner and he said that the softening is not surprising given the extent of the rise in borrowing costs and he said he thinks a relatively soft landing for the property market he's pinched a bit of language here from the yeah. uh, the other economists on the on the economy front he said a soft landing uh, it looks looks likely for the property market it's still achievable because of the unemployment rate which is right. expected to remain low and the high proportion of borrowers on fixed rates. Yeah, and look, it depends on obviously interest rates surging is the the key catalyst behind behind this, and obviously inflation and the cost of living. You know, you've then got less money to spend on your mortgage payments each month, um, and we'll kind of get into the meat of it. But you know, ultimately, this is an important economic barometer historically and and present day and in the future and it's just very simply like in an economy where it's largely geared around consumption 
you know, it's all about the ability for the consumer to spend. And so what's their you know, disposable income each month is obviously a key part of that consumption story. And if their disposable income, if more and more and more of it is actually being taken away because their interest payments on their mortgage is going up, well, then, of course, that means less disposable income. That means that damages that consumption story. And ultimately, that's that's where how the economy grows by people consuming more. Right. So there is, this is a key economic barometer. I do hesitate to talk about house prices too much, only because if you own a house, well, it's one of the most important things in your life. Of course, if you don't own a house, well, then, yeah, because if, if there's people listening to this going, well, I don't own a house, so who cares? Well, it is important from a macro point of view. But ironically, they'll be feeling the pain in a different way. If you own a house, you're feeling the pain, the value of your assets declining and your monthly interest payments might go up. We'll talk about that in a sec. If you don't own a house, you're feeling the pain because actually a byproduct of a weak housing market is actually a strong rental market because people aren't buying houses because they can't afford it or the mortgage rates are too high so they can't afford those payments so they're not buying so they're renting of course so rental demands spiked which means of course price rent prices have gone up so rent prices are record highs um yeah so it's quite an interesting kind of dynamic that we have here in the housing market at the moment yeah i think um if you are an owner one of the things is, yeah, do look at a chart, though. You mentioned, and rightly so, the stat that the fall, the data we've had out today, is the fastest pace since July of 2009. This obviously is like the heat of the financial crisis. But if you look at the house price appreciation from yeah. the next month, all the way through basically for a 12-month period, house prices went up just by eye looking at this chart, about 25 to 30% in 12 months. Yeah, so immediately after it hit that that pace of the bottom of the financial crisis, because obviously the the response that we saw by authorities in various forms at the time really juiced the market. And actually, even over the COVID period, that two year period between kind of twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty two, on yeah. an average, we're clocking in around eight nine percent yeah appreciation. Um, it's been a great trade. Months. It's just come off the top a little bit. Yeah, well, actually, but. And this is what the press focus on. It does annoy me a little bit. That's that sensationalist headline. Oh, my God, prices are collapsing. But actually, that's not the story. The way more important story, which, OK, they are covering as well, is mortgage rates and your monthly outgoings as a homeowner. And how is that going to change? And this then, let's talk a bit about mortgages and right, what's available. So, And it depends on the country as to the typical trends and patterns of how people go about borrowing to buy a house. Now, in the UK, typically, um, we have short-term mortgages. Well, so when you buy a house, if you've never done it before, then you, know, you need to borrow money, clearly. And you're looking at normally like a 30-year time frame over which you're going to pay off this loan. So historically, you know, you start your career, you start earning a salary, and then right now that I'm a salary earner, a bank will view me as safe enough to lend me money. As long as I can prove that I'm in a stable job, full-time employment. And normally they ask for like three months worth of pay slips to prove that you're in that job and that your monthly income is what you say it is. And then, right, they tend to lend against that. And they'll say, right, you can borrow four times your annual salary. That's the kind of rough ballpark maths, right? Fine, you borrow the money. But over what time frame? And typically, the banks give these deals where, right, you can have a two-year fixed rate mortgage or a five-year fixed rate mortgage. And typically, what happens is, let's just take a two-year example. You'll get a sweetener where you'll get a two-year fixed rate which is discounted because the bank wants to get you in and get you on the books and then after those two years elapse your mortgage rate will then revert to a floating rate which is linked 
to the central bank's interest rate. Okay, so it'll be the central bank's rate plus one percent. Okay, so let's just say. But of course, what people do in the UK, they do their two-year fix. Great, they get this cheap deal, and then in two years' time, they don't just let that loan roll onto that base rate plus one variable thing. They then just rearrange and go and get a new mortgage deal with a different bank, and then they enter into another new fixed two-year deal, right? And typically, if interest rates are low, this is a great way of going about it. You know, you have flexibility, you can shop around, um, you can change your mortgage up every couple of years, okay? But what's happened now is this has turned into an absolute nightmare because you've been, you fixed your mortgage. Let's say you fixed it in 2021 for two years at a rate of, I don't know, let's just say roughly one and a half percent interest rate that you could have got on a two-year mortgage in 2021, maybe even lower, right? But let's just say one and a half percent. Okay, great. You fix that in. Perfect. Super cheap. My monthly interest payments aren't that massive. Perfect. Now you're facing a nightmare because two years on, either the mortgage you have is going to roll onto this base rate plus one, or you got a rearrange and fix with someone else but of course the fixed rates are now north of five percent so you you're going to move from an interest rate of one and a half <clears throat> to an interest rate of five now what what does that mean in terms of actual pounds in your pocket or pounds going out of your bank account i'm rough it obviously depends on the size of your mortgage and how much you're borrowing but the averages are roughly speaking you're going to get about um i think it's Two million homeowners are going to see their annual mortgage payments increase by more than £3,000 in the next 12 months. So go back to my original point. Disposable income. And how much can I get out there and spend? Well, if I'm now minus £3,000, that's not a small amount of money. And so it's expected that A that's going to have a very negative drag on consumption and therefore the UK economy broadly. But then also B, it's going to mean bad news for the housing market from a demand point of view, because people aren't going to be buying houses. They're not going to be upsizing and getting a bigger mortgage. They're not, or if they're not on the market, they're not going to buy because rates are too expensive. So demand has collapsed. So of course, prices are coming down. Yeah. I mean, on that point, one article that jumps to mind was something I saw that was talking about uh, investment bank MDs. So at an MD level, this is where your compensation is typically right. very high. Yeah. And this was specifically talking about the investment bank division, so bankers. Right. And as we've discussed many times, the deal flow has dramatically slowed over the past 18 months or so. So bonus sizes have been slammed. And... One of the problems here is a lot of these MDs have very nice houses and very expensive house, uh, places in London. And so, you know, they they themselves, I mean, even though they get paid astronomical sums of money, they don't have five million in the bank to put down for a Georgian townhouse in the West End. Yeah. So they've got <laughs> very big mortgages, essentially. Yeah. And I was reading this one person who was kind of uh, used as a case study. I think his mortgage rate it went up to something like he was paying 25,000 a month. Oh. It jumped up to having reset on like two year. <laughs> and so basically there's MDs who are basically having to fire sale everything because they right. just can't afford to keep that, their lifestyle, even though they're at the upper echelon of their so-called profession. Or they're forced to sell the house, right? Yeah. And so, and this adds to the declining price trend and momentum because they're forced to sell there's not much demand so like in any market how do you price it well it's obviously supply and demand isn't it and when mm. when there's there's not much demand you got to just go lower on price and so what's happening is you're getting you know asking prices that's one thing that's what the seller would like to sell for but these days it's a buyer's market mm. meaning they they've got the power and they'll come in with a bid well below the asking price and the sellers either if they can 
stay in the house and just ride it out over the next X years, or they might be forced to sell, in which case they have to take that low ball bid. And of course, that then marks that mark to market lower, and that's the price decline momentum in you know building. So be- before we talk about the US and how they're different, one thing is, is where are UK interest rates heading now? Mm. And I say that because there was an interesting comment from the chief economist of all people from the Bank of England yesterday. And firstly, very interesting comment that was yesterday was that um, Hugh Pill is the guy's name. And he said he pushed back, well, essentially he pushed back against market expectations. And he was indicating that he would vote to keep rates at five and a quarter percent for a, a longer period. However, he's come out today, looks like he's had his hand slapped by his <laughs> by powers that be. And to clarify, he's now saying the Bank of England needs to be particularly wary about letting inflation persistence dynamic set in. So he's kind of like reverting back a little bit to well, perhaps we do need to hike. Yeah. Um, and then he said, we have not yet seen a downturn in core inflation, which would reassure us. Um, so yeah, a bit of yeah. bit of flip flopping commentary there from the chief economist. But where are we at the moment in that rate debate? Really, uh, I think it's really difficult to call for the UK. Um, so five point two five percent. That's where we're at at the moment. What is it? Fourteen meetings in a row of hikes, and a, or maybe it's fifteen. I lose count now. And, and and it's about like when we talk about the US, we're pretty confident they're at the top. No more hikes. And fine, they might hang around at the top for a bit. Let's see. And who knows? Maybe you might get some cuts. I don't know, back half of next year kind of thing. I think there's more visibility in the US. I think in the UK, the inflation situation isn't tamed yet, like it seems to have been in the US. And so what we're seeing is like stats like wage growth is remaining at I think record highs, or if not record, it's certainly super high levels, right? And this feeds into um, sustained inflation. And the labor market's still pretty tight. And so, you know, employers are still having to pay higher wages to get workers in. And so, yeah, we're, we're a bit worried that the inflation thing's hanging around for longer here in the UK. So what are the what does the Bank of England do about that? Do they either think, 5.25% is now high enough, and that's going to deliver pain that over the months ahead, let's say the six months ahead, that pain will then naturally see consumption start to get eroded and find that inflation story starts to turn. Or are they more worried and they think 5.25% as a peak rate isn't going to do the job? We need to go higher. And you know, and I, and I think that your Hugh Pills soft soft landing. Oh no, sorry, that was the Robert Gardner. Sorry, Robert Gardner. Wide. That his soft landing in the housing market, I think, will be very dependent on what happens with interest rates. And do the Bank of England go more? Then you've got a much more you've got a hard landing risk increasing there. If they go more, well, of course, all this mortgage pain just increases. And then naturally, the speed of that house price decline picks up and it starts to turn into a much more rapid collapse rather than what is at the moment a steady decline. Hmm. Um, yeah. one, one interesting item linked to this this week was that price rises in British shops had slowed to their lowest rate since October. So when we're trying to like piece together where inflation is heading. However, I thought the interesting part of that was, okay, fine, prices are slowing. Um, this is a good sign if you're tying it to inflation. However, there are three major supply risks that were also highlighted, which could disrupt the pattern specifically of food inflation, uh, which we already know is tracking way higher than than the rest of the inflation metrics so here they were talking about grain exports from ukraine are in jeopardy again and this is tied to the fact that russia pulled out of something called the black sea grain initiative so this was an agreement about the passage of of grain coming out of ukraine which is um almost one third of global grain exports 
Then there was this idea about poor harvests across Europe and beyond. And I know it's hard to believe there's been a summer if you're based in the UK, but in Europe, it's almost the other way around, I think. Yeah. And then three, India, in their decision, they've placed uh, export restrictions on rice. Yeah. I think their rice prices are up like 30% or something. Well, did you see that the Philippines, in response, um, have introduced, the government's introduced a rice price cap so like here we've had like any you know gas price energy price caps well in the philippines mm. it's a rice price cap um yeah so for sure those supply risks are still there right in the system so mm. so yes yeah as you say it's hard hard for the visibility for the uk but but so how about going back to the housing market the us then so, yeah so you talked about this idea of um, the, the kind of short term nature of how we access mortgages here in the UK is the US the same or different? So it's different. <laughs> um, well, when I tell you that the house price situation in the US, well, prices are still going up and actually they're record highs. But hang on, their interest rates have sharply gone up on a super high. And mortgage rates, if you're trying to get a new mortgage now, are even higher than in the UK. You're looking at north of 7%. So it's like, hang on a minute. How, how, why does that then not have the same negative impacts that we're seeing in the UK? How are prices still going up? Well, it's quite So this is all about the difference in the, in the mortgage, you know, the structuring of these loans for homes. Now, in the US, it's, it's completely different. Almost all, I think it's... Uh, yeah, north it's like almost all homeowners um when you buy a house you enter into a 30 year fixed rate loan agreement that's done and set up front okay there's none of this two year fix five year fix you know roll onto a new deal rearrange none of that you buy a house you get a loan one loan for the lifetime of the house or well sorry for 30 years at a fixed rate okay now if now that rate right now, if you're buying a house now, 7.2%. Okay. And that's the highest since 2001. If I'll use my same example, if in the US you bought a house in 2021, okay, you would have secured or you did secure a 30 year fixed rate of 2.7%. That's locked in. That's an amazing rate. Now it's 7.2, right? So if you are if you own a house and you bought it pre this interest rate spike, you are happy days. You've got a super low, relatively super low interest rate on a mortgage for the lifetime of the loan, 30 years. The problem in the US is if you sell your house, well, then you lose that mortgage deal. You can't, so here in the UK, you can what's called port your mortgage. So if you sell a house and buy a different one, you can basically take your existing mortgage with you and it just rotates onto this different property. You can't do that in the US. Sell your house, you lose your deal. So of course, no one's selling their house because they, they don't want to switch from a 2.7% interest rate to a 7.2% interest rate. So existing home sales have collapsed. The supply has collapsed. Now, demand has also weakened for the same macro forces, right? Interest rates are really high. People can't afford to buy. Demand has dropped. It's just in the US because of this difference in the mortgage system. The supply of available existing homes has collapsed even further. So you go back to just the simple supply and demand dynamics, and because supply has collapsed by even more than demand, then actually prices are still rising. Um, so, the, and actually, a, a kind of bit of a kind of second dimension impact on that is then home builders in the UK, they are, you know, literally going out of business, worse conditions for decades. In the US, home builders are having a heyday because it's, Where's the supply? If you do want to buy a house and get on the market, there are no existing homes for sale because people don't want to sell. So you've got to buy new homes. So actually new home sales has gone through the roof. 
And I think it's like it's making up like 30 percent. Um, uh, one third of active listings right now in the US, one third of all listings are new homes. Normally, the average over the last couple of decades, like pre-COVID and interest rate heights, the average is about 13 percent of listings are new homes. Now, now that's risen to it's more than doubled, almost mm. tripled. Um, so, yeah, you've got this really quite unique set of circumstances in the U.S. housing market that's led to a collapse of existing home sales, prices therefore still rising, and yet affordability for new buyers being at, you know, the worst conditions for years and years. Okay, so we've had we've had both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. But we mentioned at the, the top of the episode, Denmark. So what's the situation with Denmark? Well, the good old Danes. Um, half of that. So again, the 30 year fixed rate deal is very popular in Denmark, similar to the US. You buy a house, you enter into this deal, it's 30 years and it's fixed. Okay, more than half of homeowners in Denmark are on a 30 year fixed rate deal. Okay. But where they've got a better system than the US is if you sell your house, of course, remember, that's the problem in the US. No one's selling because you lose that low rate. In Denmark, two options that the US don't have. If you sell your house, you can either buy out your mortgage. But if interest rates have gone up, your the value of your mortgage essentially gets marked to market down. So you, you benefit from essentially having a discounted amount that you can buy your mortgage off at. Okay, that's one way. That's a bit more complex, that. There's a si more simpler option, which is easier to get your head around. When you sell your house in Denmark, if you've got a 30-year fixed deal, the buyer can take over that deal. So essentially the loan, it, it belongs to the property more than the owner of the property. And so this frees up the market and enables people to sell and buy. If you've got an existing home, right, I'm going to sell it. I'm not going to, my buyer is going to get the low rate deal I got, I secured back in 2021. So they're happy. And I can then go and buy another house and I'll get, I'll get the low rate deal that the previous owner of that house used to have. So it just frees up the market and it means that supply hasn't collapsed. So yeah, I, I do. I wonder uh, how the affordability angle works there. So if I was a first time buyer as, as a 25 year old compared to a 55 year old. Yeah. My earnings and my existing capital. Could it, can I take it over? I'd, yeah so i i don't know i mean that's all a top level that all sounds hunky-dory and makes sense but yeah for sure when you get into the weeds of it um different credit ratings if your new buyer coming in has got a lower credit rating well then yeah how does the bank feel about that uh, so i don't quite know how that works to be honest just a final question tying it back to the actual people who offer these mortgages so what's the pro and con as a financial institution a lender offering the uk model or the us model well the us model again is a bit unique and it's essentially government backed because you've got fannie mae and freddie mac so essentially your your mortgage deals with the government then fannie mae and freddie mac package these mortgages and sell them to banks and investors, right? Um, in the UK, that's not how it works. It's, it's the banks. You're, you're borrowing directly from, you know, the, the publicly owned banks. And so, you know, for, for, I guess for those banks, it's here in the UK, it's a more nimble market. So, um but then, you, you know, you've got this headache of getting a lot of churn because every two years, customers are rolling off. And then so you've always got to be trying to win these customers back. And so there's that huge sort of sales and marketing effort around. It's a fierce marketplace. 
Um, so that that's that's a real headache. Um, but then, you know, you're not stuck, you know, as a bank. Imagine if most of your customers are on a 2.7% 30-year fixed rate loan arrangement. For a bank, that's a nightmare. Um, yes. Given rates are now where they are, right? So it's funny. I remember um, sitting on the desk in 2008 and used to have uh, Bloomberg with lots of different screens. And one of them, a lot of them were like um, price monitors. So you'd have different asset classes or products. And we'd had this like ladder of different equity and sectors. So you could just identify visually what's out and underperforming. Yeah. And I remember seeing uh, Fanny and Freddie. Yeah. And they were down like 25, 30%. So this was even before the bank started to get hit. So it was like the very first domino was like all the signal was when those started to get absolutely drilled. Yeah. And then it there was actually a bit of time there. I mean, I say time, I'm talking days before then it kind of like became like, wow, this is a serious problem at the time. Yeah. I mean, this and that that's just those that, that extreme moment, right? Where you you get a sharp collapse in house prices because that then means of course you get the value of the asset declines below the the level of the loan that's secured on that asset okay so you're now underwater and at the same time the economy is collapsing so people are losing their jobs and they can't afford to pay their mortgage payments anymore so there's foreclosures and there's defaults but the banks are wearing the pain because ultimately if they then sell the asset or well, they don't reclaim the same amount of money as their loan liability and so they end up losing money and then the housing market it's like a vicious cycle right because then if there's a lot of forced selling well then of course the prices collapse even further and that that was that that kind of well i'll call it what once in a lifetime moment maybe careful careful <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna live to a hundred Pierce so uh all right well look we've we wanted to talk about the housing market the most uh, I feel like we've done that now so let's just yep. briefly touch on the other two subjects so firstly UBS uh, again the media kind of juicing the headline the biggest ever quarterly profit and they were referring to the 29 billion dollar gain but that being a result of the accounting difference between the $3.8 billion price UBS paid for Credit Suisse and the value of the acquired lender's balance sheet, essentially. But the other things I thought were quite interesting was just how big and, and dominant now UBS is and is going to become because the combination now um, puts their global franchise, as they refer to it, so all parts of the business, um, essentially close to 5 trillion in client assets. And yeah. you know, looking at their share price, I saw a chart of UBS against European and US peers in the investment bank space. And everyone's kind of like quite erratic, but generally not going anywhere up marginally. But UBS has gone through the roof and actually they were already up 30% um, for the year. Yeah. And then they were they opened up about seven percent yesterday. I don't think they finished quite as high, but we're talking about a 30 plus percent gain on the year. Uh, their market value now is gone over BNP Paribas. They're now rank as the second um biggest in Europe after HSBC. Right. Um, they've trumped that of US lender Citigroup as well. Right. Well. I mean, on the face of it, you think, hang on a minute, they've done, they've had a, they've got an absolute steal here because they've basically bought Credit Suisse. And, and here's the, it's, it's entirely an accounting thing, right? There's 29 billion. Um, if you took out the Credit Suisse deal, their profit for the quarter is actually 1.1 billion. But it's reported at 29, as you said, it's the biggest bank profit ever. Do you know what? Do you know what the previous record was? So J.P. Morgan set the previous record in 2021 
um, they had a profit of 14.3 billion, which is a straight up genuine profit. This this is 29 billion, but it's an accounting trick. Um, but then you think you think, hang on a minute, because they bought, remember, they bought Credit Suisse for 3.4 billion. And now, hang on, they've made 29 billion out of that. You're like, wow, that's like the best trade, the best deal in the history of mankind. But I guess it's easy to think that now, but you go back to that banking crisis, um, you know, back in, in the spring, and it's not that there was zero risk here. I mean, they did step in and take a big risk. Yes, they were in a position where they could force an amazing deal, but it wasn't risk-free. All right, fine. It's all settled down and it's all turned around uh, and happy days. What people haven't, maybe don't quite appreciate, this 29 billion profit was actually lower than expected. Uh, analysts had actually forecasted a 33 billion um, profit. Um, and so that's just because actually the outflow from uh, of deposits from Credit Suisse during the crisis was actually a bit higher than they thought. The outflow was $10.6 billion. But basically, yeah, UBS bought the asset book of Credit Suisse at an incredibly discounted level because there was uncertainty as to how much deposit outflow there, there would end up being. Anyway, it's all worked out incredibly well, <laughs> obviously, now. Um, what, what I thought was quite controversial, because you know, obviously, they're right, they're now going ahead with the merger. It's going to take years and fine. There's lots of cost efficiencies that UBS think they can find within that credit source entity. Inevitably, there'll be a lot of job losses, of course. Um, but one thing that they announced in this earnings that they they announced that they, they're going to merge the domestic businesses and essentially phase out the whole Credit Suisse brand entirely. That's a 167-year-old brand. And the only reason I mention this is because this is getting political. Because actually there was a poll done back when the kind of rescue took place and 75% of Swiss nationals do not agree with UBS phasing out the Credit Suisse brand. Um, and there's an election coming up, and this is all getting quite political now. Around right, you know, all these political candidates are getting asked, you know, what do you, what's your position on the, you know, UBS Credit Suisse deal? And so it's kind of entered into that political arena a little bit. But well, all I know is Roger Federer was Credit Suisse, not UBS. If I well, oh, if, if I'm not yeah. wrong, so you know, when it comes to Swiss identity. Yeah, on a right. global level. Can I just finish on the share price? You mentioned it. Mm. So it has, it's actually just broken uh, 30, oh, sorry, 23 Swiss francs. Okay. Quite a key. And it just jumped this week, as you said. What's key about that? It's actually broken above the 2015 high. So that's actually the highest now since 2008. Okay. For the, for the UBS share price I'm talking about now. But it's at 23 Swiss francs, right? And you mentioned, oh, it's more valuable than Citigroup now or, or in well, yep. in terms of, yeah, assets under management, let's say. But do you, do you, its share price, UBS's share price, 2007, pre-financial crisis. So remember, it's at 23 Swiss, Swiss francs now. It's had a great year, 30% up, multi-year high, 23 Swiss francs. It was 71 Swiss francs in 2007 so whilst it's had an amazing year it was <laughs> i'm going back even further ubs's share price was at 23 swiss francs in 1993 so you could argue in 20 in 30 years it's gone nowhere <laughs> uh, i hope there's no uh UBS stockholders who've been holding <laughs> since 93 <laughs> listening <laughs> just for their own sanity hang in there um all right well look, let's go on to the final one which was just quickly to talk about the US from a very top level 
Uh, yeah. We are recording this on the 1st of September, so non-farm powers is yet to come. But even before that, there's been some interesting data in something called jolts. So perhaps you could give us a bit of colour about what that is and, and what's been happening. Yeah, so there's the thing called the jolts job open rate. So it's economic data released every month, and it's one of the many, many measures on the labour market. And this one's looking at job openings. So as the name suggests, you know, in total across the entire economy, how many jobs are being advertised for right now, for positions that are genuinely available, where companies want these workers to start as soon as possible, and this is like a salaried role, okay? Um, and the thing here is it's a measure of how tight the labor market is. And Point being, if the higher the job open rate, well, that's a measure to say that there's a lack of supply of workers because companies can't fill these positions. And so we had this peak uh, back in December 2022 where it got above 11 million, okay, 11 million job openings and start, you know, companies just couldn't find staff. The problem is this is inflationary because what happens if you can't find someone to fill your job opening, well, you you got to offer more money, right? And then this means wages go up, which then, of course, incomes go up and then consumption goes up and it all feeds into that inflation story, right? Um, so over 11 million in December 2022, it's now been declining ever since then. And it's one of those key measures that the Fed look at um, as to, right, what are the labor market conditions? And they feed this into their decision making around their inflation forecasting. And therefore, are they going to continue to raise interest rates or not? And the key reading this week came out and it's for the month of July. So it's a little old. But the point is that it dropped um, below nine million now. So it's actually at eight point eight three million job openings. Um, that was a lot lower than expected. Um, the forecasted figure, I think, was um, 9.4 million, actually. So it came in a lot lower than expected. It was expected to go back up. Not only did it not go up, it declined, and it went below the key psychological 9 million level. So it's, a, it's further evidence in summation. It's further evidence that the the the... Tight conditions in the labor market in the US are easing. And this feeds into the whole narrative. The Fed are done. There's no more rate hikes. And if you go and have a look at the stock market this week, they've had a great week. You know, S&P and the NASDAQ have been nicely and strongly up on the week as people get more confident again that the Fed aren't going to hike any further. I love that. I love the, it's like Main Street suffers, yet yeah, Wall Street up. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Just the perverse nature of how markets work. And yeah, just to kind of supplement what you said, economists, they are expecting the increase in non-farms to come out momentarily to have moderated further in August, having already posted in July the second smallest gain since December 2020. So kind of all marrying up, if you like, in that way. The other thing is jolts. So J-O-L-T-S. So the J-O is job openings. Yeah. The L-T-S is labor turnover survey. And on that side of things, um, the labor department said that uh, it also showed the number of people quitting their jobs dropped to levels last seen in early 2021. Basically, Americans becoming less confident about yeah. the labor market. So yeah, all, everything all coming to that same same point you said cool well look let's wrap it up there and, and finish things off thank you very much as ever peers thank you everyone for listening have a fantastic weekend and we will see you same time next week yeah have an awesome weekend bye-bye